Hi again, this is Gary Zacharias. You're part of the Apologist Bookshelf, our podcast, that, where we take a look at books that I think are important, that I've gotten a lot of good out of as I've uh, worked my way through apologetics. I want to introduce a book that I haven't talked about before, and it may scare some people off. It's called The Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics. Norm Geisler is the author. It's over 800 pages long. It is a monster. But it, that means it's got so much good material. It's just organized alphabetically, uh, different topics having to do with apologetics. And just to give you an idea, I'm just going to take one uh, part here. It's going to be in the letter D, and it's dealing with Daniel, the dating of Daniel. And that's how the letter D starts out in this section of the encyclopedia. So if you think about the book of Daniel, I've, I've read that several times, and there seems to be a lot of predictive prophecy in there. It seems to talk about these various kingdoms that are going to march through uh, human history, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And if it's true, if if that dating is, is real and if it's true prophecy, that gives you a great evidence of the divine origin of the Bible, doesn't it? As well as other books of the Bible. So what did Daniel do? Well, Daniel looked ahead in time to the different kingdoms that the Gentiles would bring about from the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. That was about 600 B.C. down to the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire by 200 B.C. was uh, influencing its area. And under Pompey, uh, the, he took over Palestine in 63 B.C. So the book of Daniel talks about a world, uh, several world events hundreds of years into the future. And uh, we see Daniel 11 especially presenting a sweeping display of all sorts of history from the reign of Cyrus to the reign of Antichrist and the millennial kingdom and on to the end of the age. Wow. Well, here's the catch, or here's what the uh, key of this is. If Daniel did write in the 6th century B.C., that's what conservative scholars have maintained, then that's a huge uh, comment on predictive prophecy. It's a real uh, plus for the idea of predictive prophecy. But... Here comes the uh, issue that people talk about. So if Daniel wrote in the 6th century B.C., that's what conservative scholars say, then that's a great example of predictive prophecy. It's just jaw-dropping. But we get, of course, a challenge, don't we? If Daniel is dated around 170 B.C., that's what some scholars argue, then what's Daniel doing? He's writing history, not prophecy. It'd be, for example, right now, I'm writing this at the beginning, or reading this at the beginning of 2024, if I say, you know, someday Arab terrorists are going to take the World Trade Center and they're going to smash airplanes into it, you wouldn't say, oh, that's amazing prophecy. You'd say, no, you're just writing history because that happened years before. So there's the issue. <clears throat> is Daniel 6th century B.C., then it is prophecy. If it's 170 B.C., then it's just history. So then we get quite an argument going there. One way that Geisler is going to argue is what he calls internal evidence supporting an early writing. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, that the historical parts of Daniel are so clear, and they're so detailed, and they're so accurate, that that may l lend itself to, to be actual prophecy. And Daniel talks very clearly, makes a distinction between the present from the future, and that shows that he thought he was writing prophecy, not history in those visions. I said before the rise of modern skepticism about the supernatural, that a 6th century day for Daniel wasn't even questioned among Bible scholars. So the philosophical presupposition coming along saying, well, you can't have anything supernatural. So then you start by saying, if there's nothing supernatural, then Daniel couldn't have written this in the 6th century BC. It had to be history. So... There are other witnesses that's moved beyond that. So there's internal evidence, and he says, look at the witnesses that support an early writing. Like who? Well, Josephus. He was a Jewish historian from the time of Christ. He listed Daniel among the prophets, <clears throat> not among the writings, which would be the two of the three sections of the Jewish Old Testament. So you have the prophets and the writings. The writings are history, but that's not what Josephus did. He put Daniel's work among the prophets. So for him... And his time period, Josephus saw Daniel as a prophet, not a historian. And the prophets were considered to be older. So Josephus supported early writings. Who else did? Jesus. He confirmed that Daniel was a prophet. He used the example of a prediction made by Daniel that was even future in Jesus' day. So Jesus referred to the 
uh, abomination causing desolation. That's Matthew 24. And he's talking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Roman army of Titus. And there's strong historical evidence that the Synoptic Gospels were written before that, before the temple was taken over and, and crushed by Titus. So uh, Dead Sea uh, manuscripts also support an early Daniel. Uh, they found a fragment of Daniel from probably the 2nd century B.C. among the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran. Well, that's just a copy. And if that's a copy, it means the original would have been far earlier. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 14 mentions Daniel. And Daniel, if he's in Ezekiel, Ezekiel was 6th century. So that seems to bring him back further in time. The Jewish Talmud attributes the book of Daniel to the prophet Daniel, living in the 6th century. It says, even a late Daniel did a lot of accurate predicting. Even if you say, okay, I'll go with you. I'll say it was 170 B.C., but it says it still makes some of Daniel's predictions amazing. They're still supernaturally accurate. Well, here's one example of that. In Daniel 9, 24 to 27, the prophet predicted that Christ would die, having made reconciliation for iniquity and having brought in everlasting righteousness some 483 years after this decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And the decree was 444 B.C., now, if you start playing arithmetic games there, you'll come up with 33 A.D. Uh, if you take 444 B.C. and subtract 483, uh, you have to worry about lunar and leap years and things like that. But you end up with the time of Jesus. Now, that was obviously, even if you say Daniel's 170 B.C., for him to nail the exact time of the Messiah, that's supernatural. But there are some objections to predictive Daniel. So here we go. So this is what uh, Geiser's going to get to. Some critics say, well, if he's a prophet, how come in some Jewish Bibles he's listed among the writings, the history, and not under the prophets? But that was a late decision, about 400 A.D. So he was, up until that time, he was listed among the prophets. Josephus listed him. Uh, so he would, he would fit under the prophets here, very clearly. Other people criticize. They say, well, the theology is too highly developed. He was writing about angels and Messiah and resurrection and final judgment. That came along later. But the Geyser said, well, that kind of begs the question. If Daniel is an earlier book, then Daniel is proof that this, quote, highly developed theology did exist at that time. After all, Job and Isaiah referenced the resurrection. Malachi and Zechariah were written before the second century. They refer to the Messiah. Angels are even in Genesis and all over Zechariah. So that doesn't seem to be a really strong argument. Here's another argument. Well, Daniel had some errors, some historical errors. So that makes uh, divine inspiration of Scripture a little shaky. Well, however, <laughs> I like this, however, says Geisler, none of those errors that Daniel is charged with have really stood. So, for example, According to Daniel 5, 31, the kingdom of Belshazzar fell to an invading army, and Darius the Mede, became king. So some people have jumped on that. Modern scholars said, well, we haven't found anybody called Darius the Mede. So they say, oh, Daniel got mistaken. He got confused that thinking that the Medes conquered Babylon when it was really the Persians. And they claim that Daniel confused Darius, the king of Persia, with the conqueror of Babylon and identified this figure as Darius the Mede. So that appears to be an error. Well, Modern archaeological evidence shows that Darius the Mede could have been a different person than Darius the I of Persia. Two men equally fit those references. Cyrus the Great may well have been from the Median side of an alliance for the Medo-Persian Empire, and he could have been known outside the area as Darius the Mede. So that's a, that's a possibility, I guess, as well. Um, what else is there? What about the idea of Belshazzar? Daniel called him the son of Nebuchadnezzar and that he was the ruler, and he was never king. But said radical critics even say those are pretty weak arguments. Uh, critical commentaries tried to make a big deal that Belshazzar wasn't a son of Nebuchadnezzar and he wasn't king of Babylon. And sometimes that's still being used as a way to whack Daniel and can say that he was not accurate historically. But it says it's been clear for a hundred years that it's true that Nabonidus was the last king of the Neo-Babylonian dynasty, 
but it was Belshazzar who was ruling Babylon. So so don't worry about calling him son. That's not that important. Here's another attack. Well, Daniel's vocabulary is from a later period. Linguistic critics say, oh, there are words in there that didn't come about until the second century B.C. But one Old Testament scholar says that argument doesn't work at all because other people have shown it's well recognized that Greek culture had penetrated the Near East long before the Neo-Babylonian period. And it's actually just a fallacy from ignorance. Just because a word isn't known to have been used in an earlier period doesn't mean that it wasn't, unless we have some kind of omniscience about language that we know everything about that language. And I said, actually, as you know more and more about ancient cultures, you find the evidence of earlier usage. So where does he come down after all of this information? Geiser said there is strong evidence that Daniel's predictions come from the 6th century B.C., making them amazing uh, predictions of uh, everything from Babylon through Medo persia Greece, Rome, to even the time of Christ. Uh, Geister says critics don't gain anything by post-dating Daniel. It still demands, even if they date it then, that Daniel wrote some amazing prophecy in Daniel 9 about the coming of the Messiah. Um, so, I hope that part about the years didn't confuse some of you. Um, I've done a talk on this, and uh, I won't spend the time on it because I don't want to get in the weeds. But if you look up something about the the uh, predictions that Daniel made about when Messiah would come, he has groups of sevens, and if you add it up, you'll get the, the right amount there. That's interesting, but it's probably too detailed, and we don't need to worry about that now. Okay, well, that gives you an idea. The Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics, Norm Geisler. What an amazing life. Geisler wrote so many good things, and it's huge. And you can look up anything you want. Uh, it's just a chock full of good information. So don't let the size of it scare you off. Okay, well, thanks for being part of this podcast. See you later.